with every defeat, the dark rot will grow and soon it will take us all. They say dreams are visions of our memories, thoughts and fears. They're seen by our own. Conditions can be a tricky thing to tackle in media. Not that it can't be done or hasn't been tackled successfully, it's just not easy. If done wrong, you run the risk of trivializing the issue or villainizing those with it. I think this becomes trickier in the realm of video games, where one of the main goals is fun. You know, you, you typically play a game to have fun. Even horror games are meant to be fun. And mental conditions they're not necessarily fun. Overall, not many games have tried to tackle this issue, and probably for good reason. Infamously, Dead Space 3 was going to, but EA thought, yeah, that's cool and all, but like, what if you did it, and instead we destroyed the game by making it co-op and shoving in microtransactions? And then another EA exec was like, you know what would be better is if we set unrealistically high sales goals for the game so we can shelf the series when it fails. And then somebody else was like, you know what would be even better than that? Let's remake the first game and then do the same mistake of setting unrealistically high sales goals and then sideline it when it doesn't succeed. EA, the smart company, the, the, the smart, rational, well thought out company. Anyways, the only other game I can think of that tackles mental illness and any capacity is Silent Hill 2, and that game's theme is more about guilt than it is about like any specific mental condition. However, in 2015, Ninja Theory set out to create a game featuring a pro tag dealing with the condition of psychosis, which leads to hallucinations, delusions, hearing voices, and flashbacks. Now that's simplifying it, of course. The issue of psychosis and how it affects people's lives is Eh, far too complex for me. You know, somebody who just reviews games for fun. I can't tell you necessarily how well this tackles the issue. What I can tell you is at the very least, their efforts amounted up to a compelling exploration of these issues and one of the best stories I have ever seen in a video game. Hellblade Sinuous Sacrifice is truly a masterfully told tale of loss, abuse, and trying to understand psychosis in a superstitious world. A world without understanding of these things or even the means to fully combat it. I'm already going to say this, this is going to be like my most dry review because it's, it's hard to write humor for, for a game like this. <laughs> If you've never heard of Hellblade before or what it's about, let me tell you its story. A tale about Senua, a Celtic warrior on her way to Helheim in order to find the soul of her lost love, Dillian. But there's just kind of one itsy bitsy teeny weeny tiny problem. Senua is losing her fucking mind. This game is truly a trip in that sense. Much of the story is told through vague flashbacks, hallucinations, and symbolism. The flashbacks are told in a non-linear order, leaving the player to piece together the timeline of events. I wouldn't say that Senua's Sacrifice is a subtle tale, but neither is it on the nose. It never makes anything so vague that you need next level IQ to understand what's happening or what has happened, but it also never makes something straightforward to the point where there's no mystery behind it whatsoever. Things are communicated clearly, if not by the flashbacks, then by the voices in Senua's head. But I like this, it allows the narrative to properly touch on the themes that it's trying to tackle while reinforcing it with symbolism, and honestly, I feel like that's no different than Silent Hill 2. Even if, you know, in Silent Hill 2 it is made clear that there is a, there is a curse overcome with the town, whereas Helheim, that's never made fully clear, but more on that in a bit. Now let's get down to brass tacks, whatever that's supposed to mean. I, I don't get what that saying actually means now that I think about it. But anyways, I'm going to talk about the plot and its many aspects. And of course, this means tons of spoilers. If you haven't played this game yet, it came out in 2017, okay? It came out in 2017. 
there's been plenty of time to pick up and play this game if you haven't. So, you know what? If you're watching a, a review at this point, coming out in this day and age, ex expect spoilers. Heavy spoilers. Senua's upbringing was anything but pleasant. She grew up in a small village with her druid father Zinbel and a priestess mother Galana. Like Senua, Galana also suffered from psychosis, and the people within the village viewed it as some sort of curse. She eventually died, and with it being implied, Senua blocked out those memories because of the gruesome nature of it. In the years that followed, her father isolated her from the rest of the village, convincing Senua that she too was cursed, and that, you know, her curse was going to lead to her and everyone being harmed. However, one day on her own while picking flowers, she saw Dillian practicing sword techniques and began emulating them from afar. Eventually, he saw her and was impressed with what she learned on her own and even encouraged her to become a warrior, something her father was against, but she defied him anyways. Now, the amount of time her and Dillian spend together after she leaves her father is kind of unclear, but what is made clear is that she passes the warrior trials and her and Dillian remain friends until they eventually become lovers. One day, while in a swamp with him and some other villagers, she sensed the presence of death and soon after, dead bodies showed up along with a plague, that of which the people blamed Senua for. After Dillian's father dies from said plague, all the fear Senua's father instilled in her start resurfacing, and worried her darkness will take Dillian, she leaves the village, wandering the earth and eventually meeting a scholar turned slave, Druth. They become close, they travel together, and he tells her stories of the Norse gods, and of the Northmen, their brutality, and their obsession with Ragnarok. When eventually he passes, Senua is left on her own and her darkness starts to consume her. This leads her to eventually return home, yet when she arrives, she finds that the Northmen have slaughtered her village, and worst of all, brutalized her love Dillian as part of a ritual called the Blood Eagle, I believe it's called. And that leads us to the events of this game, her journey into Helheim. Now that we've gone over the general timeline of the events that led her to this game, we can start deconstructing its many facets. Starting with how this game represents psychosis within its presentation. During the development of this game, Ninja Theory worked closely with not only specialists but patients dealing with psychosis to learn as much as they can about their experiences. With that said, having watched the making of this game, they do make it clear that at the end of the day, the experiences those with psychosis have can never be fully replicated due to the personal nature of these things. It's kind of why I said earlier, I can't really say how well this game portrays psychosis because I myself don't have it. However, the people they work with, specifically the psychosis patients, seem to have high praise for Ninja Theory's efforts here. And who the hell am I to disagree with those who actually personally experience it? So, what I can say is that, for me, for somebody who doesn't have psychosis, this just creates a really cool visual and audio experience. And yes, I am aware how odd it is calling something resembling a deep psychological condition people actually deal with as a really cool experience. But I also say that from a place of thinking that the sense of delusion and unease it creates and how it makes me think about what it must be like is what makes this so cool and enjoyable. It's not just cool and enjoyable because it looks and sounds good, it's all these visual and audio effects put you in her mind. On that note, Senua is a fantastic protagonist. Yeah, she's kind of a mess, but you get the sense that she really is this kind of like lost child who's barely making her way through her, her trauma and, and what she's going up against. Senua has a very innocent personality, and you can tell by her deer in the headlights face. Jokes aside, her intentions and the way she reacts to what's happening show a pure naive nature to her that makes you want to root for her success. But anyways, aside from all the typical things that go into presentation being top-notch, like the music, the sound design, the fidelity of the graphics, the level of detail in the environments and models, and all the other stuff, 
You have the ways they incorporate the symptoms of psychosis, such as using visual fakeouts, a lot of distortions, flashback hallucinations that are filmed in live action and visually blur in and out as if these memories aren't coming through 100% clearly and hence might not be totally accurate. Doors are opened by finding runes in the environment that are sometimes obvious, other times require Senua to piece parts of the environment together to make a rune up out of nothing. There's also the voices in Senua's head, and this effect was created using a binaural mic if I pronounced it properly, which if you don't know what it is, it's a specialized mic for creating 3D audio. And it creates this kind of like weird out of body experience that I don't think any other game has given me. At least not in the way Hellblade does. I mean, name me another game where you feel like you're both inside and outside the character's head at the same time. I bet you you can't. Granted, the setback is that to experience this properly, you need headphones or a 3D surround system, which really isn't a big deal, but like, if you don't have the latter and you intend to experience this game with a friend or you just don't like wearing headphones, then you're going to be missing out on part of the experience and that is kind of sad. Regardless, this game has the best presentation of any game I've ever played, and I stand by that. Every bit of it comes together to create such an amazing atmosphere of unease and paranoia, but it's not all doom and gloom. Within these flashbacks and illusions are a lot of beauty, moments of bliss, vivid memories of loved ones, meaning in the world where none exist. Her visions go from horrifying nightmares that consume her to poetically beautiful reminders that motivate her to keep fighting. For as much as the voices hound Senua, they also give her heads up in battle, give hits to puzzles, and show the more hopeful sides of her. Which brings us to Helheim and whether or not it's real. Helheim is Norse mythology's hell. Shit literally is in the name, okay? It's not hard to figure out. A place for those who die dishonorable deaths, or so Google tells me. Ruled by the goddess Hell, or pronounced Hella in this game, I'm not sure why, I guess that was just a creative liberty they took. Speaking on Hell for a second, I mean Hella, I'm just gonna call her Hella. Hella's story parallels Senua's in some interesting ways. Being one of the daughters of Loki, Odin cast her into Helheim out of fear of her power, but also made her ruler. An interesting way to lock someone away for sure. Like, yeah, I'm gonna cast you into literal hell and stuff, but like, come on, I'll give, you, I'll, I'll give you power over the dead. Pretty sweet deal, huh? And look, I'm sure there's a whole lot more to the actual story of hell and hellheim. I'm going off of what the game has presented, though. <laughs> Anyways, Senua herself is a strong warrior with a power of sorts, and hence her father and the people of her village fear her for it, shunning her in her own way. Now, she is never officially cast out, she leaves for her own volition, but leaving because you feel completely socially ostracized from your community is really not that much better. <laughs> it's, just, it's just not. Which is what I think makes Hela the perfect villain to go up against, even if she is hardly present. Thematically, she casts a mirror on Senua and asks the player to question the idea of whether or not Senua is cursed. I mean, it, she could be if she parallels Hela so much, right? Which leads directly into the question of whether or not Helheim itself is real, because it's hell. It's set up to be a mystical place where you don't quite know what to expect other than horrors. There's almost a Silent Hill quality to Helheim. It's clear that everything Senua faces is a hell of her own making, but how much of that is her pure delusion or the influence of Helheim? It's impossible to say. It is never made fully clear if magic does or doesn't exist in this world. Certain things are later revealed to be pure delusion, like Hela herself, but whether or not Helheim is real is left a mystery. I mean, there's definitely a physical place tied to the idea of Helheim, that's for sure. Playing into this, the first flashbacks you get are with her time with Druth. And Druth, if you don't know, in Norse terms means fool. Which immediately begs the question, is she fooling herself or is she being fooled? Like, fooling yourself implies intentionally going out of your way to loot yourself in order to, like, ignore warning signs or not accept something you've done. It's a choice. But how much of a choice do you have when the thing that's eluding you is your own mind that you can't even really control? 
Applying this idea to a place like Helheim effectively forces the player to take Senua's word. You can't blow it off completely as just a psychotic rambling or psychotic episode because, for all we know, there could actually be a magical element at play that is putting her in real danger. And in doing so, it actually makes me take her struggle a whole lot more seriously because even if I am to accept that nothing, and I mean nothing Senua sees is real, and it's all in her head, that doesn't make any of it less distressing. When she takes a hot blade to her face as a demonic voice taunts her, it's painful to watch her go through. When she goes up against a giant foe or other hellish threat, I'm not any less concerned for her safety or invested in getting her through the next battle. When I open the 15th door by finding yet again another rune in the environment, sure, I'm wondering if the runes are actually needed to open the door if Senua's mind is just playing tricks on her, but then I start wondering about the significance of these runes and what they mean to her and, and why she feels compelled to seek them out before she can continue her journey and that's an interesting question to ask. I don't have an answer but it's an interesting question. I'm sure you could actually piece this together if you found out what the runes mean because these are actually Norse runes, I've looked them up but I'm, I, I can't commit what they actually mean to my memory especially when I've only looked them up once. I did have the idea, and again, I don't know what these runes mean, so please correct me if I'm wrong, but I did have the idea while writing this that maybe these moments in the story where Senua, you know, stops to find these runes are moments where she's feeling doubt, and the purpose of finding these runes are for her to find motivation to keep going. And I think that idea is also very interesting. And again, this is just a thought that popped in my head while writing, don't take it too seriously, but the fact that the game makes me even consider these things, I think is a testament to its quality. It has me, at the very least, engaging with the ideas it presents, and I think that's the first step to understanding anything, you know, getting me invested in wanting to learn more. One thing is made clear, you can't easily control it, or simply overcome it. To an outsider looking in, it's easy to dismiss everything she's going through as a loss of touch with reality, and I guess to an extent it literally is, but that doesn't make the experience any less real. Reality itself might not be subjective, but the way we see reality totally is. And that doesn't even apply to people with psychosis, I think that just applies to people in general. Like, take a philosophical concept like God. Now, before I continue on this point, I do not want this to turn into is God real or not debate because I have no interest in having that right now. I only wish to make a greater point about how people see the world. That being that regardless of whether or not there is a God, you know, he is real in the eyes of many people and in that sense he does play a significant part in their reality. Psychosis or no psychosis, all our realities are shaped by perception to one degree or another. They even explore this through the beliefs of characters like Druth and Zimba. And again, that's not to say there aren't objective realities or that having religious faith is the same thing as having psychosis. What I am saying is that the way we see reality is never fully based on reality, funny enough. Understanding that, understanding that even me and ha have my own biases and my own perceptions that play into how I view reality, it's easier to look at psychosis as a different way of the brain seeing the world and not simply as just a mental affliction that somebody needs to be rid of. So ultimately, the question of how real or not Helheim is, is honestly irrelevant because for Senua, this is her reality. Helheim exists, she's going to go save Dillian, why does she believe these things? Can't really say other than she grew up in a superstitious world and her psychosis and her childhood trauma and her grief, the very real grief of finding somebody you love gruesomely murdered, you know. And these are all things she had no control over. She, she didn't choose to have an abusive father or to have her love killed or to have psychosis. It's just all things kind of placed on her that she now has to deal with. Now if this was modern times, she could seek professional help, but Senua doesn't exist in this world, she exists in hers. So like, tough shit, huh? Guess she's doomed to suffer. Or maybe not, because one thing Hellblade doesn't shy away from exploring is how environment plays a factor in how psychosis and honestly all mental conditions form, and how these problems can be exacerbated through trauma. 
and at the same time it also shows the importance of having a good support system that you can rely on. These ideas can best be shown through the differences between her father and Dillian. Her father, for example, is an abusive piece of shit. Like, I brought it up earlier, he is a druid in a superstitious world. To him, her psychosis was a curse, a darkness, something he needed to suppress within her. To that end, he drove the idea of the darkness into her head, put her in a hole whenever she would have an episode, and would smack her when he thought she was out of line. She was made to believe by him that her symptoms would lead to herself and others being harmed, and internalized that. But then there's Dillian, sweet, sweet, innocent Dillian, who not only doesn't see her symptoms as a curse, he sees them as a gift. A way of seeing the world like no one else can. Send you a girl, you got good taste. Not only is he a skilled warrior, he's understanding towards your problems, encourages you, guides you through your episodes, reaffirms you when you're doubtful, and honestly he's pretty damn cute. Like let's just let's just be honest here. Dillian is a beautiful looking man. Seriously though, some of the most emotional moments this game has to offer is when Senua is remembering him. Because you really get the sense that not only does Dillian love Senua from the bottom of his heart, but that he was really the only positive influence in her life, this, you know, except for maybe Druth. Druth, I guess you could say, is the only other one who, who maybe had a positive influence on Senua. Either way, it's in these years with Dillian where it's implied that Senua was at her best. She resisted her father, found the courage to join the villagers, and become a warrior. And in the parallel of Dillian and her father, one thing is made clear. When in an abusive environment that refuses to acknowledge you and what you're actually dealing with, these things can spiral and lead to greater problems down the road. But when given support, when placed in an environment that understands and doesn't shame you, you can overcome these things and live a great life. This was another idea they worked on while researching for this game. That environment and trauma has a big part to play in all of this. That psychosis on its own doesn't simply make somebody unhinged like Senua. That there's more to it. Because at the end of the day, the darkness, her belief in it, and that she has it, this was something pushed on her by her father, and if anything, her psychosis is just manifesting it into something that feels a lot more real. Which is the saddest thing about Senua's past when you really think about it. After the plague shows back up, those doubts come back, and she leaves for no other reason than she believes she's a problem. And she does so unaware that it would be the last time she would ever see Dillian again. Playing into this idea that Senua is beating herself up for something that is not her fault, there's a flashback to when Dillian's father dies of the plague, and Dillian turns red for a second and blames Senua. But this is one of the times where it's very clear that she's dreaming this up, as the following scene has her bring this up to him and he just kind of earnestly denies it. Like he doesn't get defensive, he's just like, Senua, I, ne I, I never fucking said those things, like what the hell girl? You've done nothing wrong. Again, Dillian is a genuine sweetheart and even in grief does not see Senua as a monster or blame her for it. He truly was her main support system and never faltered in that and yet it wasn't enough to stop her fears and doubts from overwhelming her. Which is what really at the end of the day makes me root for Senua in all this because even as I'm aware that Dillian can't be saved, even on a first time playthrough it starts to become pretty clear halfway through that that can't really save Dillian, you still hold out hope that she can bring him back because you want to see these two reignited. You want to see Senua get the one person who truly loved her back in her life. In that sense, I also think that's another great aspect that puts you into the mind of Senua. Like her, I want Helheim to be real, for Hela to be real, and for Senua to reunite with her long lost love. To accept that this is all an illusion she constructed would be logical, but then if that's so, then you have to accept that Dillian really can't be brought back. Which then also leads into another question, if Dillian can't be brought back, is this whole journey for nothing? And for me the answer is no. Because in the end, even though it's revealed that Hela isn't real and Dillian can't be saved, Senua ends the game with a better understanding of herself and her upbringing and recognizes the way her father affected her and remembers the encouragement Dillian gave her. She does confront her grief for better or worse, physical or not. 
she does confront these feelings head on. She can't bring him back, but she can hold on to his memory, the lessons he taught her, and cherish him through that. It really is the textbook definition of a bittersweet ending. Like, you feel bad that at the end of the day, Dillian can't be saved, but you feel better for Senua because you feel like she worked through something important. Hellblade just has top-notch writing. It's dark yet mature. It's gruesome yet beautiful. It shows a great amount of care for exploring these things thoroughly while still being an entertaining adventure. This, however, all comes at a cost. That being, at the end of the day, Hellblade is more movie than a game. The bulk of the gameplay is set around telling its story and doing so thoroughly. And in the long run, I actually do think that's good because one, if they had overloaded this game with gameplay while trying to have the same amount of cutscenes and story, the experience would become bloated. As it stands, the game is about 8 hours and consists of 3 acts. Act 1 where you fight 2 gods, Sut, Sert? I think it's Sert? Is it Sert? Anyways, you fight two gods, Sert and Valraven, for passage across the Bridge of Souls. The second act, you collect pieces of the sword Tyrfin so that you can slay Hela. And lastly, is the climb to Hela herself. But the second reason I think it's actually a good thing that there's really not much gameplay in this game is that had they tried to make the story more in the background and not front and center, then it risks not commuting the points that they really wanted to get across here. Hey, at least it's not the medium, a game that has no subtlety because the main character just comments on everything that's happening, giving away all the subtext. It's also why I don't mind all the, like, obvious AAA linear level design tropes that are on full blast here. You know, like the forced walking, and having the camera rip from you, and everything that in most other games would absolutely piss me the fuck off. Because at the end of the day, the story here actually is truly great. Even though the story is fantastic, if you are the kind of gamer who doesn't like games like this, who doesn't like games that are more story than game, then this game really might not appeal to you. I mean, I still think you should give it a try because the story really is that good in my opinion, but I also won't blame you if you pass because of that. Now, that's not to say that the puzzles in combat can't be fun, but it's also just not enough to carry a game without the narrative experience attached to it. Starting with combat, because it's pretty straightforward, you have the essentials. Light attack, heavy attack, guard break, running attacks, a dodge, and a parry. If you are even half decent at parrying, and I say this as somebody who isn't half decent at parrying, I kinda suck at it, then it's not hard to beat this game. In fact, like, correction, if you suck at parrying like I do, it's still not hard to beat this game. <laughs> I like it though, there is a heftiness to Senua's swings that feels just right for her size and the sword she's carrying. Hits also feel impactful like they should. You never fight more than two or three enemies at a time outside of the end of the game which is, you know, for, for story reasons. And if you're knocked down, you have a moment to get Senua back up by mashing a button. And if you're hit before you get back up, then it's game over. Each time you're knocked down in a fight, it becomes harder and harder to get up, so ultimately, you don't want to get knocked down too many times. Your moveset doesn't really evolve throughout the game outside of a special state you can go in that slows time and heals you for a bit, which honestly makes the game pretty easy because in combination with the knockdown system, you have way too many things to fall back on in a fight if you start feeling pressured. The other new move you get is a charge attack that becomes necessary to make certain enemies invulnerable to your attacks. I mean vulnerable, not invulnerable. As for the enemies itself, it's a short and simple line of a sword grunt, mace grunt, shield guy, brute, and an axe throwing assassin. But to be honest, these, none, none of these enemies really do much to change combat. Like, yeah, a shield guy needs to be guard broken, but any player with even a lick of common sense is already going to be incorporating guard breaks into their playstyle by the time these guys show up. So it, it doesn't really change much about how you approach combat. The axe assassins do keep me on my toes a little bit, but not by much. And once you learn their attack patterns and that you can follow up parries with the, with the charge move that makes enemies vulnerable, then these two also become very trivial to deal with. There are specific combos to do, and each move flows into each other nicely, and this allows the combat to feel fluid while weighty at the same time. And that's the thing, 
this game does have proper animation canceling, which means you can go into any move in a combo about almost any time, you know? There are certain animations that, you know, do need to play out before the next attack plays, but again, it's not that slow. And it does allow for some really broken combo strings, if I'm being honest. Like, once you learn that you can go into a running knee attack, which guard breaks every enemy at just like any point during a combo, then it is really easy to perpetually stun lock an enemy until they're dead. Like, really, really easy to do so. And this can be done to all enemies except for the bosses and, and the brutes. Those are like the two exception. I will say one thing I guess balances this out is the fact that if you are fighting more than one enemy the other guy will jump in to stop your your combo so this really is more of a tactic when it's just you and one other guy left but still it, it once you learn this fights become pretty damn trivial for me the real problem with the combat isn't what you can do because there is some cool stuff you can do it, it's more the lack of incentives to learn the more interesting aspects of its combat or to learn interesting ways of putting these moves together. You really can just get by with parries and basic attacks and some dodging. Let's just put it this way. The only reason I even learned like half of these things that you can do was was just my attempt to plow through the combat on my second playthrough because I just wanted to experience the story again. Which should tell you everything about how this game incentivizes you to master its systems. Even the bosses are just fine, they work, they're cool visually, and they all have their own attack patterns, but at the end of the day, parry, strike, a little bit of magic and you'll be alright. Then you have one last aspect to the game, which really isn't an aspect to the game, because it's kind of a lie, but after the first encounter, you get this kind of screen, this text that tells you if you die too many times, Senua will get sent back to the beginning of her journey, and this implies a sort of limited life system within the game. And that's cool, except that, that, that it's a fucking lie. There is no limited live systems. You, I, I know this because at some point during my first playthrough, I tested this shit, and you could die as many times as you like, it never resets your progress. On one hand, I get that because being such a narrative-driven game, you know, having a system that, that could send you right back to the beginning would get in the way of telling that story, but also, I actually disagree with that premise as well because this whole story of Senua being, you know, dealing with her own delusions and shit. I think there is something to be said about a system where, where if she fails too many times, she gets sent back to the beginning. It, I think it would play into the idea that she's dealing with psychosis and dealing with some, some delusions in her mind and those delusions could put her in a mindset where she would undo all her progress if things got too hectic. Plus, I think games like Hades have shown that you can significantly reset the player's progress while still having a narrative-driven game. At the very least, this should have been like an extra game mode, you know, like, make this like the highest difficulty, a permadeath difficulty, where if you die too many times, it actually is game over. It's just, it is weird. Like, why even include this text if, if you weren't gonna do it? My only guess is that this was intended and that they, they, they were going to implement this feature, but they never got around to it and they then never got around to removing this text 
As for the puzzles, they're all based around illusions as you would have guessed and they're a mixed bag for me. Because on one hand, they do fit in with the story and this whole idea of psychosis. They do a great job of putting you in the mindset of Senua and making you start to understand how she sees the world. But also, the, the puzzles hardly evolve past look at something in the environment. No matter how much they try to dress it up, that is every puzzle in this game. If you're not looking for runes to open doors, you're looking for fragments to look at in a certain angle to show a path that wasn't there. Or you're going through a gate that changes the environments, which sounds interesting, it sounds different, but in essence you're just looking for gate, then you look through gate, then you go through gate. And these gates, and honestly none of these rune puzzles are ever set up in a way that requires you to like use greater thought to, to piece together a solution. Like, going to the gate specifically, you could have had all these different gates that change the environment in the same way, but you gotta figure out which ones change the environment in a helpful way, versus which ones change the environment in an unhelpful way. But they don't even do that. You know, there there is no using your intuition to figure out a solution. It really is just find the thing they want you to look at, and then look at it from the angle they want you to look at it from. At the midpoint of the game, you do get a few specific one-off puzzles that are kind of neat, but even then, they're not that complicated. One has you go through a cave that loops in on itself, it has multiple paths that you have to figure out by observing the similarities between the different rooms. And that was kind of neat. There's also this other moment where you're stumbling through the dark and you have to use sound and the tiny bits of light you have to navigate. The one thing I don't like about this segment, and honestly the last one as well, is that it forces you to walk the whole time, which makes the experience feel much slower than it really needed to be. My favorite puzzle that this point of the game presents to you is this island with these masks that change the world from light to dark. It's just this fun little unfolding box that opens up as you switch back and forth between the world states and figure out the order they want you to do it in. It's one of the only times where I feel like the game is actually making me use my intuition to piece together a solution. But even then, at the end of the day, as much as I like this puzzle, it it is mid in comparison to other games, especially those of the survival horror genre, which I guess you could say he said he was a part of? I mean, this is definitely a horror game. And then you got like the last one-off puzzle it presents where you gotta just run through this maze and look for runes. Yay! In the last act of the game, there is this kind of cool segment where you gotta navigate the dark and go from light source to light source before this monster, you know, attacks you in the shadows. Yeah, I don't know. It, that, those are the puzzles. They're, they're, again, there's, like the combat, it's serviceable, it gets the job done, but it is also not nearly close to being the most compelling gameplay in the world. But you know what? I am, again, fine with all that. In most other games this would be a problem, but I'm making an exception for Senua's Sacrifice because I really do love this game's narrative. Like, this- understand that if nothing else, Senua's Sacrifice is a bit of an exception to a rule, not the rule itself, okay? And that's only because it truly tells a, a magnificent tale. There's so much more about this game I could go into, but like I only have so much time to talk about games and so much I even want to say. And also, like I, I gotta leave something for you to experience on your own. Like I, I don't want to be that reviewer just goes through every little fucking detail a game has and meticulously explains it. Like I want to leave something open for people who haven't played this yet to experience on their own, right? And. So, I don't know, yeah, that, that's Hellblade. Um, either way, what are your thoughts on Hellblade? You like it? Hate it? You think it, it tells a good story, a bad story? Are you picking up Hellblade 2 at any point? Let me know in the comments section below. And if you like this video, hey, I, I appreciate a, a subscribe, a like, a comment, you know, all, all the good stuff that helps a channel like this grow and thrive. But anyways, I'm Digital Shinigami, and I'm gonna go play in the void now. See you all later. Bye.